Today's video is sponsored by Amino Apps. Amino is the app that features communities based around video games, movies, anime, comic books, you name it, and allows users to create blogs and discussions within each community. Naturally, Fire Emblem has its own community, and this is where I spend the most time on Amino. Here you can find blogs and posts about all things Fire Emblem related, and there are public chats you can join in order to get to know people better. This app is available on both iOS and Android, and you can follow the links in the description to download the app. And no matter what you're into, Amino is the app for you. And you can also follow me on Amino at Blazing Night. In fact, I have exclusive blogs and posts that you won't find anywhere else, ranging from which Fire Emblem characters should deserve their own game, to a breakdown of how Binding Blade could be improved if it were to be remade similar to what they did with Echoes. And speaking of Binding Blade... It's interesting to see franchises evolve and change over time, as their early days can be very different from how they are now, and Fire Emblem is probably one of the best examples I can think of. Just look at Gaiden and Genealogy. Saying those games are different from the norm is like saying Mice Number 9 was a huge disappointment. Kinda speaks for itself. Though the series went through many changes, it wasn't until the GBA era where Fire Emblem really began to establish its identity, and it was thanks to none other than the Japan exclusive, Fire Emblem The Binding Blade. This was the game that set the standard for the series, and every preceding title followed in its footsteps, so it's quite the milestone for the franchise. While personally, I don't think it's one of the strongest entries, it's still a wonderful game and has all the aspects that make Fire Emblem great. This goes for characters too, and seeing how I recently did an entire Let's Play of the game over at my Let's Play channel Blaze Plays, by the way you should watch that Let's Play, I feel now is the perfect time to celebrate the heroes that brought Burn to its knees. So join me everyone, as it's time to commemorate the brave souls that fought alongside our boy Roy, as I count down my top 10 favourite Binding Blade characters. I repeat, favourite Binding Blade characters. This isn't an objectively best units list, just my opinion on who I thought was the best. But to be clear, I will only be including playable units, otherwise a certain king would force his way to the number one spot. And with all that cleared up, what say we honour the heroes of the Fire Emblem game that shaped the series into what it is today? as well as the warriors who got me through my very first Let's Play. Sin. I've made it clear in the past that I prefer archers to bow knights, and while I've played more Fire Emblem games since then, I still feel the same way. Takumi and Jamk pretty much sealed the deal. But with that said, I have begun to appreciate the bow knight class much more, and Binding Blade was possibly the biggest reason for that, case in point being Sin, who was definitely one of my strongest party members and showed me just how potent Nomads could be. You've done your people proud, boy. Due to the events that take place prior to Roy's journey, Sin enters the scene as an enemy along with Fur, until he is set back on the right path thanks to Sue. Though I can't really blame him for his actions, when times get tough, you gotta make ends meet somehow. Like a lot of characters from Sakaia, Sin doesn't talk much and acts very stoic and serious which admittedly didn't make him a very interesting character to me and I didn't think he was particularly unique or memorable, plus there were a few supports he had that I felt did nothing for him. Though for what it's worth, he's still cool and I find his supports with Fur and Sue to be good. And while he may not be much of a conversation, his actions spoke far louder than words ever could. Because of the size of the maps and the overabundance of Wyverns, I'd say Nomads are significantly more potent in this game, which gives Sin an edge over other archers, made even better by his stats and growth rates. Starting out, Sin is rather balanced and his growth rates favour HP, skill, speed and strength. Plus he gets some very nice hard mode bonuses, though everything else is rather lacklustre. While he isn't as fast or lucky as Sue, he makes up for it for being more durable and hitting harder. Plus his speed and skill are usually enough to make him double easily and otherwise always hit his mark, and I find him to be an ideal unit for any player, especially on hard mode. At this point, I think I will always favour archers over bow knights, but who knows? Perhaps the more I explore the series, the more I will begin to see them in a different light. And if Sin is any evidence, there's always the chance that could happen. Gonzalez. I assume everyone is familiar with the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover and what it means. After all, I thought Madoka Magica was going to suck at first and look like weeaboo trash, but was proven wrong on so many levels, and pretty much every recent DC movie looked great in the trailers, but turned out to be shit. Except Wonder Woman, the film was goddamn beautiful. Fire Emblem is no stranger to this concept too, as Gonzalez may seem like a terrifying monster, but in reality he's an absolute teddy bear with a heart of gold. In fact, the only thing scary about him is his battle performance, so in essence he really is a monster, and I love him for it. 
Because of his appearance, Gonzalez is often feared and shunned by the masses. However, those who actually take the time out to get to know him will discover a kindness not even Silk can compete with. Gonzalez is not a very smart person and isn't fluent in the art of conversation, but gosh darn it does he try his best, and whenever he does manage to form a sentence, I see the essence of a very caring and warm-hearted individual, and I find Gonzalez to be very endearing thanks to his support, since while he doesn't talk much and most of the time he pities himself, those he interacts with help to boost his confidence and focus on what makes him special. And oh boy is Gonzalez special, because once you see what he can do with an axe, then you'll really have a reason to fear this man. Gonzalez is unique for being the only playable brigand in the GBA series, and depending on which route you take after chapter 9, his starting level will change too. Gonzalez starts with high speed, HP and strength, and his growth rates excel in the exact same areas, while everything else is rather low, though he also gets hard mode bonuses. Gonzalez hits very hard and is very fast, easily able to double straight out of the gate and very often take down just about everyone he goes up against. Unfortunately, as everything else is so low, he isn't the best at landing hits or taking magical damage, so I'd recommend not pinning him against anyone that has an advantage over him. But if you stick it out with Gonzalez and make him Berserker, <laughs> well I can tell you from first hand experience, you've earned yourself a one way ticket to victory. Not judging people based solely on appearance is a life lesson everyone should learn at some point, and thanks to Gonzalez, Fire Emblem will make this a lesson you never forget. Shana Ah, oh, Pegasus Knights. I find myself loving at least one of you in every Fire Emblem game. From Shida, to Erinus, Fiora, Claire, Marcia, and the one true waifu Sumia. In regards to Binding Blade, my heart goes out to Shana. While she's not one of my favourite Pegasus Knights, though to be fair, breaking into that bracket is almost a lunatic levels of difficulty, she still stands as a solid Sky Knight and I loved having her on my team throughout Binding Blade, whether she was in a conversation or a conflict. As a member of what I like to call Team Deke, stop snickering, Shana makes her entrance very early on to help out Roy and show that she means business. Being the younger sister of Juno and Thea, Shana is a very energetic and upbeat girl, who has a charm and sense of whimsy to her that made her just so likeable, I felt she could pass for one of the Sailor Scouts. Come to think of it, she even looks like one of the Sailor Scouts. I think I might be onto something. I must confess, I find Shana to be a rather simple character, and she doesn't exactly develop a lot, but her supports emphasise her energetic and otherwise rash nature, along with quite a few heartfelt moments peppered in between, so I guess the term simple yet effective would ideally describe her. Since Shana is the first flying unit you obtain, she has a considerable amount of utility to her name. Shana enters the scene with stats that are mostly average, though her speed is almost disgusting, and her growth rates greatly favour speed, skill and luck. All things considered, Shana is a solid choice, and thanks to her joining time and being a flying unit, I'd say she has some significant advantages, being able to double just about anyone even with her low constitution, easily able to dispatch hard to reach units, wonderful at rescue operations, not to mention during the let's play, she had so much evasion pretty much no one could lay a lance on her. It seems no matter what the Fire Emblem game I play, there will always be a Pegasus Knight who takes my breath away, and in the case of Binding Blade, Shana was an absolutely fantastic flyer. Let's just hope the Fire Emblem Switch can keep this track record going. Pray you don't disappoint me. Deke You ever find those characters that aren't the most interesting, complex, funniest, coolest and most well written, but you can't help but really like them? Well I have, and his name is Deke. As you may have guessed, I feel Deke is not the best in Binding Blade in just about any aspect, but that doesn't prevent him from being all around awesome, and I really admire this guy and appreciate him for what he is, so Deke definitely gets the thumbs up in my book. Along with Shannon, Deke first joins Roy in Chapter 2 of Binding Blade, after being contracted by Leewood, and well, he certainly picked out a marvellous mercenary. Deke may have a gruff exterior and be rather stern and boorish at times, but he's kind hearted at his core and thinks very highly of his other mercenaries, putting them before himself and always being very cautious. Deke essentially acts as sort of a mental figure for them and is respected greatly by others. Even characters like Rutger and Clarine want to know more about him during their support and won't let him out of their sights. Wow, seems they all want the Deke. At a first glance, it was easy to assume that Deke is one of, if not the best heroes in the game, and the more I used him, the more I began to realise, <laughs> yeah, he pretty much is. For such an early game unit, Deke has some beastly base stats, being strong in just about anything that isn't resistance and luck, and his growth rates are overall not bad, in particular HP is really good. While other units like Ogier have overall better growth rates, and Echidna starts as a hero, 
he can easily surpass both of them, and I found him to be an incredibly reliable unit that never once let me down, and I'd say he's a solid choice for just about any player. It's very easy to grow attached to the characters who are the best at what they do, but sometimes it's the ones who are just overall very good that you find yourself favouring, and Deke is about as good as they come, so much so that just about everyone will want the Deke eventually. Sue, remember how I said this game showed me how wonderful Bow Knights, or in this case Nomads, could be? Well, Sue is essentially the one who forced me to reconsider my feelings towards them, because goddamn does she make my jaw drop of how great she was in my first playthrough, and even in my most recent run, she was just wonderful every step of the way. Granted, if you want to get technical, she's not as good of a unit as Sin, but she's still awesome regardless, and I found her to be a much more interesting character. And you all know how I feel when it comes to picking favourites, so let's move on, shall we? Similarly to Sin, Sue got hit by the betrayal in Sakea hard, and was taken prisoner, until Roy and the gang comes to her rescue. Like most of her clan, Sue doesn't speak much and is considerably straight-faced, rather preferring to converse with the sky, trees, water, pretty much all of nature, so she's like the Fire Emblem equivalent of Pocahontas. Minus Mel Gibson and Christian Bale. Go look it up, it's legit. At first, it may seem that Sue is no different than Sin, but Sue's support shed more light on her and showed that she's actually very warm-hearted and often puts others in front of herself, not to mention expanding upon the events that took place when Burn invaded and how she deals with all the losses, which I feel makes her both a likeable and interesting character. Plus, she is certainly no slouch in the art of war. Just like with Sin, I found Sue to be very useful being a nomad and all, and starting out, her stats are generally rather balanced and her growth rates are also quite balanced, excelling in speed, skill, luck and HP. While not overall as good as Sin, especially since she gets no hard mode bonuses, I think Sue is still a strong unit to use, especially as she joins rather early on and can effortlessly double the enemies and never miss a shot. In fact, I tend to favour using Sue, as she generally performs better than Sin during my playthroughs, but that's just me. I remember when I first played Binding Blade, I said to myself, Sue is easily the best unit in the game, and while with time I've begun to see things differently, it still doesn't change the fact that Sue is simply spectacular as both a unit and a character. Guess she really does live up to the reputation of her father. And possibly mother. If they ever remake this game, Lin had better be in it. She deserves to after what happened with Fire Emblem Warriors. Rutger. Recruiting enemies into allies is a tried and true staple of the Fire Emblem series, getting new units who are often very strong, as well as characters who have a completely different mindset to the majority of the team. And this is where Rutka comes in. This guy was definitely one of the best units I've used in Binding Blade, and just about anyone who's played the game will probably tell you the same. Plus, though he is a man of few words, what he does say is powerful stuff, and manages to convey both an intriguing and noteworthy character. So while recruiting him may be dangerous, he's definitely worth the risk. Rutka enters the scene in Chapter 4 of Binding Blade, where he is hired by Lord Eric to take down Roy. However, during that time, he helps Karin escape and ends up joining Roy. From the get-go, Rutger comes off as a very cold individual, who doesn't talk much and is incredibly blunt when he does open his mouth. Yet his interactions with Clarine show that he ultimately means well, and his supports delve into his need for revenge against Burn, as well as addressing his future prospects. Not to mention, his bluntness acts as a reality check for Clarine and Fur, and makes them realise who they really are. Which just goes to show that sometimes it's not how much you say, but rather what you say that matters. Though being brilliant in battle helps too. Just about anyone who's played Binding Blade would know that Rutger dons the name Kritka due to his insane ability to land critical hits and surpass the threshold, which must mean that he's an incredible unit, right? And yes, he is. Rutger has almost deke level base stats and strong growth rates in HP, skill and speed, along with getting hard mode bonuses and having a killing edge from the get-go. Rutger was a wonderful asset to my team, having very high offense capabilities and being one of the best units to take down bosses, plus once he becomes a Swordmaster, then he truly embraces the name Kritka, except for this one time. Oh come on, that's bullshit! It seems Fire Emblem will frequently have some of the strongest units in the game be adversaries at first, which makes it all the more rewarding to win them over to your side, and winning over Rutger was one of the greatest victories I could have asked for. Chlorine. Sometimes people can get off on the wrong foot and end up harboring a natural disdain for each other, but I'm a firm believer in giving everyone a fair chance of redemption as you may just be surprised at how different people can be if you're willing to listen, which is a perfect analogy for Kareen, as at first you could pretty much pass through the word bitch on her forehead, but given time I grew to really like Kareen, and I found her to be one of the most interesting characters in Binding Blade. Not to mention, I thought she was one of the best healers I've used in any Fire Emblem game, which says a lot considering there's Natasha, Maribel, Jenny, Priscilla, Reese, 
and there's that one healer from Fates who was amazing, but her name escapes me. Along with Rutger, Clarine also appears during Chapter 4, and is presented to General Nasty in the Burn as a prize for him to do what he sees fit. Oh, I know exactly what he would do with her. After all, what else would a man of his stature do with a young noblewoman? It's obvious, isn't it? Play some Smash Brothers! Before they can enjoy each other's company, Clarine makes it perfectly clear just how strong her level of arrogance can be, as she is very stuck up and sharp tongued while being relentless with her criticisms and sees herself as the pinnacle of what people should be. Oh boy, I love her already. Naturally this makes her come off as a bit of a pompous princess, but she ultimately has a good heart and means well, she just has trouble expressing it properly. Additionally, her support is where I witness Clarine mature and grow, as she works on her attitude as well as her future goals reflecting on who she is and what she wants to be, though some of her nasty habits don't ever go away. But hey, some people are the way they are for a reason. Like all mounted units, Clarine's class benefits from Binding Blade's map design, and I find her to be substantially more useful than both Ellen and Saul. And once she promotes, holy shit does she put everyone to shame. Clarine's bases are mostly good aside from strength and defense, and her growth rates are pretty solid overall, excelling in luck and speed. While very frail, she can be one of, if not the most evasive units in the game, and once I promoted her, that's when she got significantly better. In fact, when I used her, she could deal a lot of damage and literally no one could touch her, making her the ideal dodge tank and who I felt was the best medic in the game, not counting the two pre-promotes. First impressions certainly mean a lot and often getting them wrong spells disaster, but given the chance, perhaps that person can change your mind, and Clarine knows this better than anyone as she is one of my favourite characters and healers in the game. Oh yeah, now I remember the healer from Fates that was so potent, so precious and so pretty, I'm ashamed I forgot about her in the first place, as there is no better healer than Felicia. <laughs> Percival. If you pay very close attention, you may notice that Binding Blade is kind of like a remake of the original Fire Emblem, before it got an actual remake. Think about it. The story is rather similar in many aspects, a lot of the characters share similar personality traits, heck even the character designs are very similar. This isn't necessarily a bad thing since Shadow Dragon does have its merits, one of which being its characters, and Binding Blade's equivalent to the ever so impressive Camus Percival is equally extraordinary. Being such a majestic and awe inspiring figure on top of an already unbeatable unit, Percival you do your archetype proud. Percival along with Douglas and Cecilia is one of the three generals of Euthoria, and as such, he pops up a few times during the story to let everyone know that he means business. Percival is a remarkable specimen that has a presence to him you can't help but gape at, as he comes off as someone who has so much power and authority that no one can match, yet Percival is still an honourable and noble man. Just don't test his patience, after all Narsian tried that once, and well… There's something on your face! <laughs> it was pain! His supports I felt didn't do much to flesh out his backstory or show significant growth in his character but rather reinforce his personality traits and show the impact he has on others, which I think works and as far as character goes, he's got all the bases covered, and this also applies to combat. Being one of the generals of Euphoria, it's safe to assume that Percival is a rather powerful paladin, right? Well, if by powerful you mean freaking godlike, Percival has very good base stats and is incredibly well rounded, in fact he even gets hard with bonuses and starts with great weapon levels, and yeah while his growth rates aren't good minus HP, that's to be expected of a pre-promote, can't make them too powerful now can we? Oh, right. Thanks to all this, Percival is just downright fantastic. His class is built for this game, every stat is strong and gets even better in hard mode, he can hold his own against pretty much anyone, and even though there are tons of other cavaliers you can train up, there's a good chance that Percival will be stronger than all of them by the time you recruit him, so I'd say he's a unit you simply cannot go wrong with. It's funny to see just how similar Binding Blade is to Shadow Dragon, which is probably why I find it rather lacklustre. But that does mean that everything that worked in Shadow Dragon works here, and this game's answer to Camus works wonders once again. Lelina. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this lovely lady right here is the real Lord of Binding Blade. Roy may be everyone's boy, but to me, he hasn't got shit on Lelina as in Maya she is a far more interesting character, a much more potent unit, has superior support, is arguably more affected by the events in the story, and is just better in every way in my opinion. 
and even when taking Roy out of the equation, she's easily one of my favourite characters and units in the entire game, so I feel she should be front and centre of the box art and fighting alongside Marth and Smash. In fact, you know what? Say it with me everyone. Lelina for Smash 5! Make it happen Sakurai! Make it happen! Lelina I would best describe as the Shida of this game. Hey look, more Shadow Dragon similarities. Being Roy's best friend and main love interest, is responsible for recruiting certain characters, plays a decent part in the narrative, and is a very sweet and lovely little lady, but still very headstrong and bold much like her father Hector. Yep, the same Hector from Blazing Sword. The monster who could otherwise solo that game. I bet now that he has more experience, no one in Bird could beat him. <laughs> right off the bat, I adored Lelina, and my admiration for her only grew after experiencing her supports, as we see her converse with a wide variety of characters, that range from casual conversations with those who serve her, to discussions about her future as the ruler of Ostia, and even talks about her own morals and ways of thinking, which I must say really helps to flesh her out and show just how three-dimensional she is, a stark contrast to Roy and how one note he is, especially for a Fire Emblem Lord. Honestly, out of the two of you, I don't know who's worse. Oh wait, yes I do. <laughs> when things get rough and Alina enters the battle, that's where she truly takes after her father, as this little lady knows how to turn up the heat. For a level 1 mage, her base stats are well rounded, but her growth rates are mostly below average, with the exceptions of luck and especially magic. Lelina may need some training before she can be in league with the rest of your team, but she's essentially the glass cannon of this game, being able to dish out ridiculous amounts of damage, but definitely not take the hits, and her growths make her slightly unreliable, as other units like Lu are more consistent and objectively better, but all things considered, I'd say Lelina is still good, and when I use her, she one-shot god knows how many enemies and was my quintessential late game boss killer. In fact, she could probably be strong enough to take down Sophia. Though I wouldn't know that since Wendy beat her to the punch. Roy may be the hero of Binding Blade, but taking into consideration Lelina's charm and abilities of a mage, it's easy to see why I view her as the main lord of this game, which saddens me at how popular Roy is in comparison. It's like a complete 180 on the Hector Elliwood ordeal. Ah oh well, I guess you can't win them all. Before we get to number one, I'd like to do some honourable mentions. First up is Rey. Rey is pretty much my favourite Dark Mage in Binding Blade, thanks to being a solidly written character and a significantly potent unit, so I felt he could do no wrong, but I don't think he was one of the greatest. After that, there's Chad, who could have made the top 10 as I really liked his attitude and he was a really good thief, but he could never become more than that, and sadly wasn't worthy of the list. Next up is Lance. Like the typical Abel archetype, Lance was a very reliable unit and a nice character too but he couldn't do enough to compete with the best of the best. Moving on, we have Cecilia. Cecilia doesn't exactly have what it takes to be a particularly potent unit. Then again, after taking a blow from Sophia, I'm surprised she made it out alive in the first place. But her character is a saving grace, playing a large part in the game's story and having what I feel to be some very strong support, as well as a wonderful design. And finally, there's Fur. While she does get overshadowed by Rutger, Fur can perform proficiently with enough training, and her character has a determination and sense of admiration that I respect. So in my let's play she couldn't dodge for shit, though that's probably because Wendy stole her ability to do so. Anyway with that out of the way, on to the number one entry. Milady. You know something? While certain characters can grow on you over time and become much better, I absolutely loved Milady right from the start and after playing this game over and over again, it only reinforced why I think she is the best character in this game. Milady got everything right. I find her to be interesting, well written, have great supports, play a big part in the narrative, has fantastic in-game conversations and is one of the best versions of her archetype to date and a magnificent unit who is one of the strongest in my army and every time I play Binding Blade, she only gets better and better. Hailing from the land of Burn, my lady acts as the Minerva of Binding Blade, originally a villain with a much more noble mindset and code of honour, who eventually joins Roy's army through the words of the one she is sworn to protect. She even has similar personality traits to Minerva, being very steadfast, loyal, strong and all around extraordinary, which I think works well in this scenario. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Milady spends a good amount of time as part of both Byrne and Roy's army, and we get to see how her character interacts with and adapts to everyone around her, allowing her to develop alongside the story, and I thought her supports did a great job at fleshing out her backstory and dealing with how others feel towards her and her situation. Even her relationship with her women is discussed at times, I swear at this point you're pretty much my favourite Wyvern Knight in Fire Emblem. <coughs> okay, maybe not favourite Wyvern Knight, but still amazing nonetheless. Since Milady is pretty much Princess Guinevere's retainer, 
It stands to reason that she would be considerably powerful in order to protect the princess, and oh boy is she powerful. Coming in at chapter 13, her bases are strong minus luck and resistance that get boosted in hard mode, and her growth rates are pretty good on the whole as well. Thanks to her class, I found her to have high utility and was perfect for the next two chapters in the game, and even unpromoted, she was able to hold her own against just about anyone. In fact, she could even be one of the best units in the game if everything goes well, and no matter the map or enemies, Milady proved her worth to me anytime and every time. This is all well and good, and enough to place her at the top, but there's more to Milady than just that, as what made me admire her so much was how she was able to convey the moral great and sadness that comes with war. The conversations that Milady has during the game show a side of burn that insists a sense of loyalty and honour about them, making them more than just bad guys, and even when she faces off against the generals, there is no hatred, no malice, only a mutual understanding and acceptance, as they all know where their loyalties lie, and that they'll do whatever they can to serve those they believe in, making for some of the most meaningful and heartbreaking moments in just about any Fire Emblem game. And that's why she's my favourite character in Binding Blade. Not because she's the best written, most interesting, complex or strongest unit, but because it's through her that the themes of Fire Emblem shine through and she feels the most human, as Milady is more than just a small part of Binding Blade. She is Binding Blade, and it's for this reason that Milady takes the number one spot as my favourite character in Fire Emblem, the Binding Blade. This has been Blazing Knight. I wish you all a great night, take care, and despite being one of the lesser Fire Emblem games in my opinion, Binding Blade still holds a special place in the hearts of many Fire Emblem fans, including my own as a Fire Emblem game to bring the series out of its shell and my first ever Let's Play. Thanks for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. But what did all of you think of my choices and who are some of your favourite characters from Binding Blade? Be sure to let me know in the comments below and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe as it really helps out the channel a lot and it means the world to me if you would. If you like what you saw then why not check out my Top 10 Echoes characters video or how about my Let's Play of Binding Blade so you can hear even more of my thoughts on the game. Hopefully one of those videos will be right up your alley. Please be sure to follow me on Twitter and Amino at Blazing Knight, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Anyway, that's it from me. I'll see you all next time.